Okay, uh, so good morning. Um, I'm, del I'm delighted to be here today and to kick off uh, Bay Rile 2019. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for providing this opportunity to present. So I've attended Bay Rile pretty much every year since its inception in 2011 and have very much enjoyed these meetings, um, both the talks, the poster sessions, and also I find these great opportunities to uh, catch up with my virologist friends in the Bay Area. So I'm looking forward to more interactions throughout the day today. And so today I thought I would share with you some of the work going on in our lab using CYTOF to characterize the properties of those cells most susceptible to infection by HIV. But before jumping into that, I thought I would say um, a bit about what, uh, in general, my lab works on. And so one fundamental question that many individuals in my lab are focused on addressing is this fundamental question of what makes some cells more susceptible than others to HIV infection. Now, as you probably know, the primary targets of HIV are CD4-positive T cells, but not all CD4-positive T cells are equally susceptible to the virus. And so we are interested in understanding both the cell intrinsic factors as well as cell extrinsic or external factors that will determine whether a particular CD4 positive T cell <clears throat> becomes infected or not with the virus upon exposure to the virus. And folks in my lab are um, addressing both of these aspects. With regards to extrinsic factors, we have individuals in our lab that are characterizing how the mucosal environment, including soluble factors as well as cell types that themselves are not directly infected, how they in fact can greatly promote infection um, uh, of CD4 T cells by HIV. And with regards to um, intrinsic factors, uh, we are using a variety of um, single cell analysis tools, including CYTOF, to characterize the properties of those cells most susceptible to infection by HIV. And it will be this topic that I will be presenting today. I will begin with some published data about how we use um, an in vitro system um, and CYTOF to characterize those cells that are most susceptible to infection. And then after that, I'm going to talk about how we are applying now some of the tools we developed for that study in order to characterize the properties of latently infected cells in vivo in patient samples. And that will all be published, uh, unpublished data in the latter part. Okay. So um, as a way of introduction, this slide here sort of represents how we were thinking about cellular susceptibility to HIV infection. And so these colored circles here are meant to represent individual T cells, and they are colored differently to represent the notion that T cells are diverse and that they exist in cellular subsets. And so we were interested in understanding amongst a diverse population of T cells, which ones are most susceptible to HIV entry, also known as HIV fusion, and of those which are most susceptible to productive infection by the virus. Now, studying um, cellular diversity is not easy, but it's been facilitated in recent years by the development of a relatively new technology called CYTOF. And so I think many of you here are familiar with CYTOF, um, but for those that are not, essentially it's a single cell protein quantitation tool that is analogous to flow cytometry, but it uses a mass spectrometer to read out the data instead of a flow cytometer. Like in fact, you start with a population of cells that you stain with a cocktail of antibodies, where each antibody would be conjugated not to a fluorophore like it is in um, flow cytometry, but rather to a unique mass element. And after a series of... Should I continue? <laughs> After a uh, series of uh, processing steps, these cells are eventually sent through a nebulizer. And in place of a cell, um, you essentially now have a cloud. And within that cloud, you can quantitate the different amounts of these different antibodies. And that essentially tells you how much of the antigen recognized by the antibody was um, present. And after a series of processing steps, essentially you get something looking very much like flow cytometric data. Now, one advantage of CYTOF over conventional flow cytometry is because you don't have this issue of spectral overlap, many more parameters can be simultaneously monitored. And what this essentially allows for is a much higher resolution of the immune system. And so we decided to apply CYTOF to characterize HIV infection. And for this, we designed and validated a 38-parameter CYTOF panel that can distinguish between the um, various differentiation and activation states of CD4 T cells. In addition, because my lab has a big interest in studying mucosal and tissue cells, we also included within our panel a variety of cell adhesion molecules and homing receptors. And so having established and then validated this panel, we then wanted to use it to characterize the types of cells that are most susceptible to infection by HIV. And the first step we're doing this, we first compared uninfected cells to those that were um, where HIV had fused using the following protocol. <clears throat> 
So we isolated from uninfected individuals tonsils, which we processed into something uh, known as HLAX, which is essentially just a single cell suspension of tonsillar cells. And we chose to use tonsils and not PBMCs as our targets because it turns out for tonsils, there's a population of CD4 T cells there that are naturally susceptible to infection. Whereas for PBMCs, you have to essentially stimulate them ex vivo with a mitogen to render them um, permissive. And so we thought this would be a nice system to study natural susceptibility to the virus. And so once we had our um, cells, we then either left them uninfected or we exposed them to HIV for only two hours to allow enough time for HIV entry. And we could distinguish those cells that had entered or fused using what's called a virion fusion assay, something that was developed at Gladstone quite a number of years ago now. For the sake of time, I won't dis, uh, describe the details of the assay, but essentially it can distinguish those cells that have fused from those that have not using a fluorescence-based readout. And that allowed us to sort out the HIV fused cells from the unfused cells, which we did. And we also just sorted out some uninfected cells as a control. Now, once we had our sorted cells, we then stained with our 38-parameter Cytoff panel and then analyzed the data. Now, as you can imagine, with hundreds and thousands of cells, each being phenotyped by 38 parameters, we generate a ton of data. And so in order to have a global view of these data sets, we've implemented a variety of high-dimensional data analysis tools. And one that we found particularly useful to just visualize the data is something called TISNI, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, uh, the single cell RNA sequel and commonly uses this now. And so um, just to remind you, um, uh, TISNI is essentially is a, um, a dimensionality reduction visualization tool that converts high-dimensional data onto a two-dimensional plot. In a TISNI, each dot here generally corresponds to one cell in our data set, and two cells that were closer together in high dimensional space generally appear closer together on this two dimensional plot. And in addition, um, we can color code this plot by our antigen of interest. In this case, I've color coded it by CD4, where the highest expressors are shown in red and the lowest expressors are shown in blue. And what you can see is that most of the T cells in our culture have high levels of CD4 expression, but that there are regions that have low levels of CD4. And if you take the same plot and you now color code it by CD8, you can see that a lot of um, these cells up here are CD8 T cells. Okay, so that's the uninfected T cells. Now, what do the HIV fused cells look like? I now bring up those plots, color-coded by CD4 on the left and CD8 on the right. And what you will notice is that there are some islands of cells that are missing. And so this island here, that's missing. That makes sense because those are CD8 T cells and HIV enters CD4s and not CD8s. However, there's another island that's missing, this one up top here. What are those cells? Well, to determine that, I now take these exact same plots and I color code them by two new antigens of interest, in particular um, CD45RO, which is a memory T-cell marker, and CD45RA, which is a naive T-cell marker. And you can see that these cells up top express low levels of RO and high levels of RA, so they are canonical um, naive CD4 T-cells. And the fact that they aren't fusing to HIV is because we are using a transmitted founder CCR5 tropic virus, and there are insufficient levels of CCR5 on these cells here. But what you can see is that the dominant population of HIV fused cells lies within this giant landmass here. And because these cells have high levels of RO and low levels of RA, they are canonical memory CD4 T cells. And we've done quite a bit of work characterizing the types of memory CD4 T cells that HIV enters. Some of that analysis is shown here, where here I'm showing the TISNIC for just the HIV fused events, and I'm color coding them by each of these antigens listed up top here. And this allowed us to identify the uh, major known populations of memory CD4 T cells, including central memory cells, transitional memory cells, T follicular helper cells, T regs, and also the TH1, TH2, and TH17 lineages. And essentially, to make a long story short, what we found was that HIV could enter all of these major known populations of um, uh, memory CD4 T cells. There was no population that um, it could not enter. Interestingly, however, it did not enter the different populations with uh, equivalent efficiencies, and I can say more about that uh, afterwards to anyone that's interested. Okay, so essentially what the data demonstrated thus far was that amongst a diverse population of T cells, it is a diverse population of memory CD4 T cells that HIV enters. <coughs> Okay, so now um, what about the next step of productive infection? So um, to look at that, we now um, use a slightly modified protocol. We again started with HLAX, which we either left uninfected or exposed to HIV. Now not for two hours, but rather for four days to allow enough time for productive infection. And we could distinguish those cells that were productively infected because we used a reporter, something called heat-stable antigen or HSA. And it's simply an antigen that's only expressed on the surface of those cells that are productively infected. And so um, once we waited four days for the um, infection to occur, we then analyzed the data by Cytoff. And in this case, we could identify the productively infected cells simply by subgating on those cells expressing the highest levels of HSA. 
Okay, so what do these data look like? So I'll again be showing the data in the form of TISNI, and I start first with the TISNIs of the um, uninfected T cells simply for orientation's sake. So I've taken these TISNI plots and I've color-coded them by CD4, CD8, the memory marker CD45RO, and the naive marker CD45RA. And what you can see is that the CD4 T cells on the right-hand side where the red is, the CD8s on the left, the memory CD4s are up top here, and the naive CD4s are on the bottom. And to remind you where these different populations are, I circle them here. Okay, so those are the uninfected T cells. Now, what about the productively infected ones? I now bring up those plots, and what you will hopefully notice is that the data look very different from the um, fusion data. Whereas for the HIV fused cells, we found that it spread out throughout the entire region corresponding to the memory CD4s, which would correspond to this region here. Whereas in this case, we find that the productively infected cells occupy a very small and unique niche that's not occupied by cells in the uninfected sample. And in fact, these cells here kind of fall within this little empty region right there. And so what this is, suggests is that the TISD algorithm sees these infected cells as completely different from anything in the uninfected culture. Now, why are these cells so different? There are a number of reasons, one being that HIV is known to modulate expression of various receptors, with downregulation of cell surface CD4 being one of the most well-studied examples. And indeed, you can see that the infected cells here do have low levels of CD4, as demonstrated by the blue coloring um, here. Now, the fact that these cells look very different from anything in the uninfected culture has a name. It's called viro-induced remodeling, and these cells are considered remodeled because they're phenotypically distinct from anything in the original culture. Now, the fact that HIV remodels cells suggests that this diagram I had showed earlier is not all that accurate because it's not the case that these cells are simply a subset of the starting population, but rather they've changed a bit, which I tried to represent uh, with a slight color change here. And the fact that HIV remodels cells makes it difficult to know what types of cells are preferentially productively infected because the very uh, antigens that we use to identify subsets may themselves be changed as a result of this remodeling. Now, to overcome this problem, uh, we uh, took advantage of the high-dimensional nature of CYTOF data. And what we essentially did was we developed an approach where we could predict the original state of that cell before HIV-induced remodeling. And so this approach we call predicted precursor as determined by slide. It's essentially a k-nearest neighbor method. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go over the details of the method, but just the concept behind it is as follows. So what we do is we take our uninfected cells, um, phenotype by 38 parameters, and we establish what we call the atlas of all the different types of uninfected T cells in that culture. Now, these infected cells are also phenotyped using the same um, uh, set of parameters, and so we take every single infected cell, we match it against the atlas to identify the phenotypically most similar cell. And those cells are um, circled here, and they represent the predicted phenotype of the original cell before HIV-induced remodeling. And this approach generally works because immune cells come in subsets. If there was an infected Th1 cell in the um, infected culture, there's likely somewhere in the uninfected culture an uninfected TH1 cell. And so we call this um, approach predictive precursor as determined by slide. Predictive precursor because we're predicting the precursor state of these cells, and slide because that's the name of an algorithm previously developed by our collaborators, Nandini Sen and colleagues at Stanford, where they developed slide to quantitate for modeling of cells by various cellular zoster virus. And we essentially applied the principles of slide for um, this analysis, which we call uh, PP slide for short. Okay, so using this approach, we were now able to um, uh, identify the subsets of cells that were preferentially productively infected. And this included subsets of T follicular helper cells, TH7 cells, as well as others. And we validated these predictions by sorting out these cells ahead of time and then infecting them with HIV and showing that indeed they were more, more susceptible to infection. Okay, so those are the published data. In the remaining time, I want to talk about how we are now applying PP slide to chart the in vivo HIV laden reservoir. And so because not everyone here may be familiar with um, HIV latency and the um, cure research, um, so as background, um, you probably know that we have very effective antiretroviral drugs that can um, suppress active HIV rep replication. But these drugs, unfortunately, do not eliminate the small per persistent population of what's called latently infected cells. Um, now, there are a number of reasons why it's been so difficult to um, eliminate this latent reservoir. One being that as a, field, uh, as a field, we still don't have a good understanding of what types of cells in vivo harbor latent HIV. And one of the reasons for this is that there is no universal cell surface biomarker that can distinguish these latently infected cells from regular uninfected CD4 T cells. And so to represent that, um, so if here is a representation of an uninfected CD4 T cell, where this is the nucleus, this is the genomic DNA, 
In contrast, a productively infected cell looks very different. There's integrated HIV DNA, and that DNA is firing off a lot of HIV RNA, which gets produced into HIV proteins. And you can identify these infected cells, for example, by staining, um, uh, using antibodies against HIV proteins, and then identifying these cells by facts. And in comparison, however, a latently infected cell um, looks quite similar to an uninfected cell. There's integrated HIV DNA, but for the most part, that DNA is silent, and there is no protein, cell surface protein, that can distinguish this cell from this cell. Now, because there is no universal surface biomarker distinguishing latent cells from regular uninfected CD4 T cells, direct identification of latently infected cells um, from patient samples requires stimulating them. And this stimulation will unfortunately change the phenotypic properties of those cells. And so I illustrate that with this cartoon here, essentially when you have a patient sample and you want to know which cells there are latently infected, what you do is you take that entire sample, you stimulate them with a mitogen, for example, um, something like anti-CD3, CD28. And what the stimulation will do is, is it will cause any, react uh, any latently infected cell in that sample to um, start expressing HIV proteins proteins, and then essentially that cell becomes a productively infected cell, what we call a reactivated cell. And so we can deep phenotype this cell here, for example, using Cytop, and we can have a, a very high resolution view of what this looks like. But really, the phenotype that we want to know is that of the original cell targeted for latent infection, because that's the phenotype that we would want to target for eradication purposes. And there are a number of changes um, uh, of this cell as compared to this one. Um, the two main sources of the change are, one, we're stimulating ex vivo, so um, there'll be a lot of phenotype changes there, for example, upregulation of activation markers. And the other aspect is, as I showed in the earlier part of the presentation, HIV infection itself will induce remodeling. So this cell will also look different from this one um, as a result of that. And so how do we overcome this problem? Well, we reasoned that just as in our nitro system, we could predict the state of a productively infected cell before HIV infection, that in an analogous fashion, we can predict the state of a latently infected cell before viral reactivation. And the way I like to think about this is um, in the form of an analogy of molecular facial recognition. And more specifically, I like the analogy of aging, because aging is a process that will change someone's look, but for the most part, it should not change his or her look so much so that he or she is no longer recognizable. And so just to illustrate that, um, I have here a picture of a um, uh, younger Sean Connery, James Bond, <laughs> and here is a picture of uh, Sean Connery um, you know, in the later years. And so the analogy is that this here is our latently infected cell, and this is our uh, reactivated cell, and I guess um, stimulation would be time, right? Um, and so, so the, the parallels I want to bring up are essentially that there are a lot of differences between this and this, but the identity of that cell should not have been completely lost. And so, um, uh, in the case of the reactivated cells, as I mentioned, we have this information. We can identify the reactivated cells. We can deep phenotype it. But really, this is the information that we want. So how do we get it? So we essentially apply the PP slide method for this. What we do is we establish an atlas of all the different types of unstimulated T cells from that patient sample. And we match each reactivated cell against this atlas to identify the phenotypically most similar one, this one here. And that serves as the predictive phenotype of the original cell targeted for latent infection. And so to kind of summarize the entire process, what we do is we um, identify the reactivated cell, we match it against this atlas using a k-nearest neighbor approach, and then actually there's a third step. We take the um, phenotype of that predictive latent cell, we compare it to all the other cells to try to identify unique features associated with HIV latency. Okay, so um, before jumping into working with patient samples, we wanted to first sort of do a proof of concept experiment to demonstrate that this approach can generally work to identify precursors of reactivated cells. And so we started with a simplified system of JLATs. So many of you probably know that JLATs are a latently infected cell line that derive from JERCATs. As it turns out, um, uh, JLATs have been cloned by different labs, and so different clones of JLATs exist. And because they were cloned and propagated by different labs, distinct phenotypic properties um, develop developed over time in these different clones. And so we wanted to ask the basic question of given two different JLAT clones, one called 6.3 and one called 5A8, if we stimulate them to reactivate latent HIV, can we, given the information in one of them, um, for example, the um, 6.3, can we predict that it came from these guys, which you know they did, when given a choice of these two? And so we went ahead and did this experiment, um, the results of which are shown here. And so the results are shown in the form of TISNI. And so first I show the TISNI corresponding to the unstimulated 6.3 and the unstimulated 5A8. And what you'll notice is that they are in distinct regions of the TISNI plot, demonstrating that these clonal lines of JLATs are indeed phenotypically distinct. 
down here I showed the um, TISNI corresponding to the stimulated 6.3, and you'll notice is that it's, uh, it's in a third region of the TISNI, so demonstrating that indeed stimulation will change the phenotype of these cells. So now the question is, given the information here, can we predict that it came from um, these cells here as opposed to these? And so well, what we did was we took every single reactivated cell here and did PP slide against an atlas of a concatenated or combined um, uh, version of all of these events together. And we asked how often it picked from here as opposed to here. And these are the resulting um, nearest neighbor cells. And you'll notice that it looks quite similar to this plot here and not so similar to that, that one. And in fact, there was 98.3% um, uh, overlap with the current correct one and only 1.7% overlap with the incorrect one. So we consider this an error rate of 1.7%, which we were pretty happy um, with given that these were clonal lines that derived from the same parental uh, T cell line. Okay, so, the, so that was sort of the proof of concept experiment, and so then we worked, um, we, we went on to work with um, patient samples, and for this we worked with a scope cohort at UCSF. And so. Um, one thing we had to overcome with working with patient samples, uh, and we actually spent quite a, time doing, uh, quite a bit of time doing this, is that latently infected cells in vivo are extremely rare. Only about one in a million CD4 positive T cells are latently infected. And so we had to develop the tools to be able to specifically dis, um, distinguish the real signal from noise. And what worked was essentially having multiple ways of detecting uh, reactivated cells, basically having um, antibodies against HIV proteins on different channels and then finding the um, diagonal because a lot of the um, um, background is stochastic, the chances of it appearing on two or three um, channels even is um, pretty low. And so this approach worked, and this is a natural patient sample where we can identify 20 reactivated cells um, after stimulation. And so this is one of the first uh, patient samples that we analyzed. And so um, first I show what we established an atlas of all the different types of um, unstimulated CD4 T cells in that participant. These are actually memory CD4 T cells. We purified the memory CD4 T cells ahead of time to further enrich for the reservoir because it's thought to be enriched in this population of cells. In the second plot here, I show um, where the reactivated cells fall within this atlas. It's actually 20 cells all on top of one another. Maybe it's hard to see, but it's basically this red dot here. And this just illustrates the notion that indeed reactivated cells are phenotypically distinct because they're kind of in a um, uh, distinct region of the TISNI. So then we did our PP slide where we took um, each one of these 20 cells and mapped, put it against the atlas, and then these are the, where the cells um, uh, ended up. And then we have an overlay to try to see where in this atlas these uh, latently infected cells are. And so this is just some of the ways that we can analyze the data. We have what we call a map of where the latently infected cells are. That's where these red dots are. Um, and so we can look at any antigen of interest in our panel. And here I show PD-1 because it's an antigen that has been shown by others to be preferentially higher on um, latently infected cells in vivo. And you can see that indeed regions um, where our latent cells are do tend to have higher levels of PD-1. We can also use unbiased clustering analyses where we get a computer to identify cells it thinks is more similar to one another. Um, we use the flow sum algorithm here and the different clusters here are co um, colored uh, each uh, differently. And so um, some of the things that we can ask are what is the proportion of latent cells in each of these clusters and what are the markers that define each of these clusters. And some of those analyses are shown here where we have the different clusters. Here we have the 20 latent cells each colored according to the cluster it belongs to. And interestingly we're finding that the um, um, uh, there are some clusters that HIV uh, latently infected cells is particularly enriched in. Um, finally, uh, so we are also doing a variety of validation studies. So we phenotype these um, cells by about 40 different parameters. So we have a lot of information as to where we think or what are the phenotypic properties of the latent cells. Um, and so what we can do is we can design a sort strategy for any of the markers that we have that are surface markers. And we can actually sort out those cells and do various validation studies. So in this particular participant sample, we found that the latent cells tended to have low levels of CD57 and CD38. They have high levels of PD1 and I um, uh, uh, showed that already in the previous slide, but interestingly, they have low levels of CXCR5, which is another T follicular helper marker. They have high levels of OX40 and um, CD69 and also low levels of CD62. So we actually sorted these populations out into what we call an enriched population. And at the same time, we also sorted a variety of disenriched population. For example, these populations that we think should not have latent HIV. And just as another control, we also just sorted out some bulk memory CD4 T cells. And what we're doing at the moment is doing QVOA, which is a way to measure the um, uh, amount of replication competent HIV in each of these sorted populations. And also we've sent some of these samples to a collaborator, um, uh, Sarah Palmer, at, in Australia for uh, full-length um, 
viral sequencing to determine the extent to which these markers can enrich for HIV with intact genomes. Um, I also want to mention that, interestingly, we have been able to obtain um, uh, uh, specimens from the same participant at different time points. And so this um, particular sp um, uh, specimen was obtained at a second time point that was about six months later. And we took it through the entire pipeline of our analyses. And interestingly, we actually find similar kinds of latent cells coming up um, from the two time points. And so um, that's also illustrated here, where you can see that the same sort strategy does also enrich for um, latent HIV. So I thought this was interesting because it suggests that the latent cells um, is somewhat stable, at least over a six-month period. It's not that it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. And so to conclude, we have a novel approach for charting latent cells, which accounts for the effect of reactivation. Our data demonstrate that latent cells are heterogeneous. In other words, it's not just in one region of the Tisney plot, and that's consistent with what's known about latency. But even though it's heterogeneous, it's not random. Only specific subsets of memory CD4T cells are latently infected. There are definitely empty regions in the plot. Um, importantly, markers previously identified as preferentially expressed on latent cells, for example, PD-1, are identified by this method, and I also show that similar patterns of latent cells were identified by, from the blood of the same individual isolated on different days. And in terms of future directions, we're doing, as I mentioned, validation studies where we're sorting based on markers we think are higher or lower on um, latently infected cells. We're working with more patient samples, including tissues, because the reservoir is thought to be enriched in tissues. We're working particularly with um, lymph node specimens and also gut tissues. And also we're moving towards doing a single cell RNA-seq based approach of this analysis where we have the entire transcriptome um, uh, to look at as opposed to 40 pre-selected markers. And with that, I will end. So I want to acknowledge that the original in vitro study was done in collaboration with my colleague, Marielle Cavoin. She was the director of the Gladstone Flow Corps and now is at Gilead. Um, the uh, in vivo latency project is headed by Jason Neidelman in my lab. We also have help from a variety of other uh, folks in my lab. And also, um, Xiao Yu Luo, who's a postdoc at Warner Green's lab, she's helping us with a lot of the high dimensional analyses. Also, I want to acknowledge um, Ann Arvind, Nadini Sen, and Guru Mukherjee, who helped a lot with the initial slide analyses. Also, I want to thank the um, SCOPE cohort, and in particular, the participants, um, also funding. And uh, with that, I will end and be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Great talk, Nadia. And it looks like, uh, you know, with the single cell RNA seq, maybe you'll get that holy grail of some marker that, that identifies the latent cell. So that's really exciting. Do we, we have time for two questions. Do we have any questions? So there's what's called latency reversal agents, LRAs. And one, I think, question that we're very interested in, I don't think that the answer is known, is, you know, when you reactivate with something like anti-CD3C20, you kind of assume the entire repertoire of latent cells can be reactivated, and that with LRAs, which are less efficient, maybe it's only a subset. Or is it? Is it just that, you know, it, it does it less? So we are going to compare side by side, you know, a collection of LRAs together with anti-CD3C28. Okay, any other questions? So I, I have one question. The PP slide seems like kind of magic. Can you can you tell us a little bit about is that machine learning or how does that how does that work? This is really Really neat. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's essentially a K nearest neighbor approach. There's a particular equation that it uses where it uses, you know, about 40, we have 40 parameters that we've measured, right? We've quantitated. And there's an equation it uses to identify, um, you know, based on the K nearest neighbor algorithm, the, uh, the closest neighbor, if you will.